Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our final webinar of the 2020, 2021 Wisconsin Citizen Lake Monitoring Network Winter Webinar Series. This is Paul Skowinski, the statewide educator for the network. Today, we'll be talking about a plant that is very important in Wisconsin, both culturally and biologically, that is wild rice. We are excited to have Sarah Dance from UW-Madison joining us today to talk all about this important plant. Each one of those, these webinars is recorded for later viewing, so you'll be able to find a recording of today's webinar on our Extension Lakes YouTube channel. We have a playlist set up that includes all of our past web webinars as well as today's, so it's easy for you to find them all in a list and watch only the ones that interest you the most. Feel free to send those out to other people as well if you know others that would be interested in one of these recordings. I will have the recording out by tomorrow to everyone that registered for today's webinar. When I send out the link, for uh, today's webinar, I'll also include a link to the playlist that we've set up for all the other ones. And I'll put that into the chat during today's presentation as well. Please keep yourself muted today and your webcams turned off during the presentation. I will turn off any webcams that pop up just to keep sure, uh, make sure the webinar continues running as smoothly as possible today. Please post all of your questions into the chat box. I will be watching the chat and I will read any clarifying questions to Sarah during the presentation. Um, other questions will be held until the end of the presentation. If you have ideas for upcoming webinar topics, please email me and I'll work to find an expert speaker who can address that topic for us during the next webinar series. At this point, I will introduce our guest speaker, Sarah Dance, who goes by Dance, is a third year graduate research assistant at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Environmental Chemistry and Technology Program. Her work investigates nutrient and contaminant dynamics in the rooting zone of wild rice in Wisconsin sediments, with a focus on generating knowledge useful for tribal and state natural resource managers. Go ahead and take it away, Dance. I will stop sharing and you can start sharing your own slides. Okay, perfect. Um, here we go. Yeah. Presentation, okay. So I'm going to turn off my screen for this one just so we get better connection. All right, so hello, my name is Sarah Dance. Um, I, like Paul mentioned, um, I'm an environmental chemistry uh, and technology major at UW-Madison. Um, so I'm in my third year as a graduate research assistant. I ended up coming to Wisconsin in 2018 from North Carolina. Um, and I'll just say, you know, starting off from this work that I really am more of a sediment and water biogeochemist, so I'm not going to use all of the best terminology for the different plant parts, but I've really had to go on this journey of learning a lot more about the system as a whole in order to do my work on nutrient and contaminant fate within the rooting zone because I've really learned working with tribal partners how important the whole picture is to protecting and restoring wild rice. So I want to start off before we get into any information. Um, Oh, I need to click. There we go. Um, by doing a land acknowledgement. So I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, um, and this is the ancestral and current homelands of um, the Ho-Chunk people. Uh, and this is the official lands acknowledgement statement from the university. But, you know, for my work, it also, you know, brings me to, you know, think of more about how the Ho-Chunk people have been impacted by colonization. Um, and also, you know, explore some of those deeper ideas around wild rice, how we center a lot of the narrative um, concerning wild rice and in indigenous communities for around the Ojibwe and Menominee. But in reality, there were a lot of indigenous communities and nations that had a relationship with wild rice and how critical it was to them and how a lot of that was erased. Um, and I know that I'm not exactly sure where all of you are, but I know that you could be anywhere across the world. Um, but, you know, these are some of the different tribes in Wisconsin. So um, there's actually 12 tribes in Wisconsin. Um, and there's 11 of them that are federalized. And there, some of them are from, you know, the, the broader denomination of Ojibwe. And then there, you know, there are, of course, others that um, like the Menominee and Ho-Chunk. So who is wild rice. And I used to start out these presentations by asking, you know, addressing what is wild rice. But it, you know, a, a lot of the indigenous communities here really prioritize seeing wild rice as a being. And that shaped me as a scientist and understanding the system as a whole rather than just one component of it. 
So it's an annual emergent aquatic graminoid. Breaking that apart, annual means that it lives and dies in one year. It's not perennial. Um, it drops a seed, it lives its life, it dies, and then it reseeds itself. It's a self-sustaining system. There are actually four species of um, Zizania, but there's only two that are really relevant. Is also known as southern wild rice, um, and then Palustris is northern wild rice. And this is, um, both of them primarily grow best in depths between um, half a foot and three feet of water. And that doesn't mean that, you know, they, they can absolutely grow in um, water that's shallower than that or deeper than that. It, it really comes down more to the competing species that are there. If there's a hardier competing species that can do well um, at a certain depth, you know, it, it's probably going to outcompete rice. So it, it does grow in a diversity of environments. Um, and it does do well in a lot of different types of sediments as well. So for palustris, it actually really prefers colder environments. So these pictures here on the top, you can see wild rice actually grows in a really dense, thick stand when it's, you know, when it's a healthy stand. And on the bottom here, this person is grasping um, what the wild rice actually is, the, the seed that comes off of it, the part that's edible. And those little tails um, are actually naturally occurring. Uh, we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but they're actually torpedo shaped and those tails are meant to give them um, you know, some uh, aerial speed when they're actually being dropped into the water. So the distribution of them, um, so the dark green here is where they could potentially be present. Um, and then the like neon green color is where they're most present and not incredibly rare. Um, and you can see that it's, it's really mostly in, um, across the Great Lakes region in Michigan, Wisconsin, and a huge part of Minnesota. And this map, I don't think it does a great job um, looking at the Canadian um, wild rice lakes. I think that they actually have a lot more than this um, particular graph shows. So the ecological importance, and the ecological importance really can't be overstated. According to the US Army Corps of Engineers, um, report. It's actually virtually our only annual aquatic macrophyte endemic to the region. It has a highly speci specialized niche in our environment. So part of it being that keystone species, it has that outsized impact. So as it grows in this dense stand, it also serves as a habitat and a food source um, for a huge diversity of animals, uh, especially for the muskrat, which is also another culturally relevant um, ecological being basically uh, uses it as a habitat and a food source. Um, you know, avian species, uh, geese are absolutely love it. It can be a habitat during the floating leaf stage for um, different kinds of fish. Uh, and it also provides some incredible ecosystem services for us. So that those thick stands can actually break fast flooding. Um, as well as different kinds of storm damage impacts. And it actually does a great job of anchoring the sediment. Roots are growing through the sediment. You know, it's clinging onto the sediment. So when we have those higher impact storm, um, higher impact storm actually moving the sediment as easily. Um, and it, you know, sedimentation, sediment pollution is such a significant problem that in places where we've lost a lot of wild rice, um, we can absolutely, if an invasive species or a natural species hasn't overtaken it, you know, we could expect to see um, a lot of that sediment be moved to another location. So it, it, absolutely, play, it absolutely plays a role in ensuring um, that our waterways stay clean. And then the aspect of wild rice that I study the most is its ability to sequester harmful chemicals. Um, and so a lot of wetland plants actually do this. They can uptake certain contaminants and store them safely right at the root surface or safely within the root or the above sediment biomass, um, which just means the plant tissue. Um, there is a potential pathway for it to get into the seed, but this is not well researched. Uh, but it does end up keeping our waterways and our surface water clean. So the cultural and societal importance um, this also can't be overstated. This is such a critical part uh, for the Ojibwe people. Um, and I won't 
butcher the story, I'll just tell you, you know, briefly that, um, you know, it was a prophecy that was given to, that one of their leaders saw and that if they migrated to this area, that they would find food that grew on water. And so it's a huge part of the, Oje of the Ojibwe origin story. For the Menominee people, it, their name actually means people of the wild rice. This also ties into, you know, people of colors and indigenous people's right, just as anybody else's right to um, harvest, gather, hunt in a way that their ancestors did to keep themselves healthy. Uh, wild rice is actually significantly more nutritious than white rice, brown rice, and cultivated paddy wild rice, um, which is a different kind that I'll, I'll also talk about a little bit later. Um, and so the, the Ojibwe people actually have um, treaties that reaffirm these rights, um, that they have this inherent right to live their lives the way that their ancestors did in harvesting. And the epidemics across, you know, many indigenous communities of heart disease um, and diabetes, you know, it, it, it's so critical that we allow these natural systems to be preserved as best as possible and allow people to have a natural connection to the food sources that their ancestors did. And so this next part with the threats and declines, we've seen pretty significant declines across Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Um, and of course, these all have to be based on reports of wild rice, you know, in the early 1900s. So there is some spotty data on this. But this was a study done um, by Druez and Silbernagel from UW-Madison in 2012. Uh, and this just characterized watershed occurrences. So these are watersheds that are colored in. Um, the light blue is where wild rice was reported to be found um, in, the early, yeah, in the early 1900s through 1995. Um, and then the part shaded over on that top picture um, are actually areas where we can, there is wild rice occurrence in that watershed. So you can see that the significant loss um, of wild rice is really focused in Southern Wisconsin. And below that picture, you can just see um, a greater mapping accuracy of where those wild rice lakes are. And on the left here, we have our very beloved uh, lily pads, which are awesome and important, um, but they can also, you know, obscure um, sunlight from getting to early uh, wild rice seedlings. Um, but they're also not legal to pull them out, at least where, you know, I've, I've been ricing. Um, so the research that's been done, they really identified these top threats. The first one was land use changes within the watershed. And that is very general, but it's really meant to be a catch-all term for all the different ways that land use changes can impact wild rice. Um, one of the major contributors is, you know, new housing developments, construction, mining, um, you know, a, a new input from a wastewater treatment facility. Um, and then there's also the impact of climate change and not we're not going to put that in a black box. We'll define what that really means. You know, it's warming temperatures, it's warmer winters, it's hotter summers, it's the increased frequency and severity of precipitation events. Um, and it's also water clarity and depth. Besides, um, you know, a couple water quality parameters, water, it, the water quality itself is so critical, but the clarity is also critical because the sunlight needs to be able to get through um, the water surface to the seedling. Uh, the competition from natural and introduced species is also a significant problem. And I, you know, I say introduced because um, I've really tried to change know them as invasive. Um, but I've, you know, I've had a lot of different perspective shifts as I've worked with tribal partners talking about how plants that are simply migrating and living the way that um, is healthiest for them. So doing a reframe on that, um, you know, it, it isn't putting the blame itself on the plants. It's really turning the, the mirror back and saying, well, how did this plant get here? How did we create conditions um, in a way that natural wild rice can't proliferate, but another species can? Um, and we also want to talk about overgrazing from natural species. So even if there are some healthy ways that uh, certain species like muskrat and geese graze on wild rice, because of um, different impacts of climate change, their geese are here for a longer period uh, 
um, before they migrate away and they end up eating a lot more of the rice in certain areas. I know this is something that's being investigated in the St. Louis River estuary, and I'm really excited to see what the results of that are. Only um, pore water, which is just the water between um, the sediment particles, surface water, and then the sediment itself, different factors of it, um, the geochemical uh, composition and the changes that it goes under is also a significant factor on wild rice survival. And so in the recent news, um, we've actually seen a, a pretty alarming amount of uh, wild rice articles that have come out. Um, and most of these are from, you know, uh, Wisconsin Public Radio or Minnesota Public Radio. Um, but there have been a few stories about wild rice that have made the national stage. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just this constant call for this incredible natural resource that is unique to our region is rapidly disappearing. And there isn't a lot of attention around it. Um, and, and, you know, it, just as someone that follows this in the news, it, it's hard to see how dire the situation is becoming here and how little information is out there beyond just where we're at um, in the Midwest. Very, very few people know about wild rice outside of this region. So the, what I'm gonna walk you through today about wild rice um, is the different ways that it lives. So I'm gonna go from the seedling stage, which um, or actually germination itself. I talk a little bit about the seed banks and the dormancy, and I'm gonna walk you through all the way to maturation, the mat total maturation of wild rice, the point where it actually has this plant program death. Um, it drops its filled seeds, so it's seeds that are ready for the next season into the water. Um, and so this graphic up here is actually a graphic that I helped create with Wisconsin Sea Grant um, and Loch de Flambeau uh, and different, a lot of different tribal partners, especially Le Coup um, to actually assign um, and it doesn't match always one for one, but these are some of the Ojibwe translations with for a certain um, dialect of Ojibwe of these different stages of the wild race. And so because it's annual um, and it, it does germinate at different times in different places, but for the most part, it's gonna be germinating around April, um, May. And then in most cases, the senescence, the pro plant program death when people are gonna be harvesting the rice um, that actually doesn't happen until around September at the latest October-ish. Um, and so the first, you know, um, aspect of this that I want to talk about is the dormancy, the seed bank. And so this is right before it germinates, the winter during that period. Uh, and uh, the picture that you can see up top, um, this is from Glyphwick, the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, so this is the exact same lake, very similar water quality conditions and climatic conditions um, one year right after. And this is a commonly, and, and that green is actually wild rice itself. So you can see a pretty significant difference across just you know, a, a one year period with very little change to the environment. And this is a commonly observed cycle of wild rice. So it, uh, it typically has this boom, bust, normal, normal cycle. So after a really productive season, it's expected that the next year it's not going to do as well in that location. And then the next two years after that, it'll have its normal um, harvest. So th th this really ties into litter quality and quantity. And litter actually just means as the plant, because it's annual, it's dying every year. So all of that biomass, all of that green that you see, it sinks and actually becomes the layer on top of the sediment. And then eventually, you know, it starts to build itself into the sediment um, that's feeding the microbe nutrients into forms that are actually available for plants. So as this increase of biomass continues nature of wild rice, these microbes are so stimulated by the increase of food that they're getting from the carbon that they end up taking all of the nitrogen for themselves. And wild rice, unlike a lot of other wetland plants, it isn't limited by phosphorus, it's actually limited by nitrogen. So if the microbes are so stimulated in that environment that they take all of the nitrogen for themselves, 
the plants will actually have a response um, as the seed, even just the seeds themselves, will know that there isn't enough nitrogen to be successful and they'll stay dormant. Um, and this has been observed uh, to last about, they can stay dormant recorded for like two to five years in some cases, but there have been anecdotes and stories about it um, surviving much longer than that as well. Um, I've had, I've heard stories before of places where they knew reseeding efforts weren't happening, but it was a wild rice lake that was degraded. And then once they started to fix some of the water quality conditions in there, even though there hadn't been seeding in all, over 20 years, they did see some wild rice coming back. Um, and that's just one story, but there is always that potential of, um, you know, when we can fix the water quality, there may be, there may be past generations of rice that are still in the sediment bank that can actually grow. Um, and so there's emerging evidence on this as well, that this need for them to be under this three months of ice. This has to, a lot to do with the, just the chemistry within inside the seed itself. Um, it actually needs a period of being uh, introduced to warmer weather and then another cold snap and then warmer weather again in order to properly germinate. Um, and it, it's also, highly dependent on climatic factors, just as, just as everything else. Uh, you know, if there's, a, if there's an intense freeze or an unexpected frost early in the season, that can kill a lot of wet. So germination and seedling stage. Um, in this picture here, you can see wild rice uh, right at that germination. Climatic factors and nutrient availability. Um, and it's starting from a little bit of the nitrogen and phosphorus that was filled in it from the most sensitive life stage for contaminants to impact rice. So this wild rice has an incredible ability to um, adapt to its environment and it has some special adaptions to the contaminants that are prone to being in oxygen deprived environments like you know, wetland sediments. Um, herbicides and reduced toxic chemicals have an outsized impact on young wild rice seedlings. So there was actually a, um, an incredible study about a herbicide that's commonly ap applied to um, kill Eurasian milfoil weed um, that has a significant impact and shortens not only the plant itself, but it stunts any future generation if it's a high enough concentration. Um, as well as sulfides. So, you know, sulfide mining is something very controversial in Minnesota, but it's most, the most impact that it has in high concentrations is going to be on the seedling stage because it doesn't have those adaption strategies yet. So this is the part that I think a lot of people um, connect with, with the floating leaves. So this is the transitional stage between submergent and aerial. At this point, you know, we're still in the growth phase. We're seeing. And when it hits that surface, it's actually going to elongate, create an elongated leaf um, that's trying to get as much sunlight as possible. And it creates a few of these leaves across the surface. And it's absolutely beautiful if you can ever get to see it in person. Um, it looks like hair floating across the water. Uh, and so it, it's during this period, um, it's able to allocate a lot of energy into uptaking that nitrogen, surviving, establishing itself. But at this point, it's also incredibly sensitive to physical disturbance. And this is the stage of wild rice we see the most um, direct human impact on negative human impact on rice, because so many people don't understand how sensitive it can be in these, you know, these really mucky soft sediments that they grow in. Um, they actually end up getting uprooted and killed a lot by people who aren't following um, boat wake rules or even people who are following wake, no wake rules, but they're just so, they're just that sensitive to being knocked over during this time. And so this is the flowering stage. Um, so they can cross and self-pollinate. At the top, you can see the female part and the male part. Um, and this is, this, it's actually wind pollinated based on the evidence we have right now. Um, I, I haven't seen a lot of evidence for, um, you know, other methods of pollination outside of wind, but I'm sure they do exist. Um, but I do 
you know, that, that primary, primarily wind driven pollination contributes to the high genetic variation of wild rice across different, even lakes that are right next to each other. Um, characteristics. And so that's important because that means that this genetic variation really leads itself to these different ricing places. There's no open season, basically. Every stand of wild rice is different. It's going to germinate at a different time. It's going to produce a different quality seed and it's going to, you know, die at a different time. So it's really critical to understand um, why that genetic variation happens and why it's so important to connect with natural resource managers in an area that no have a much greater connection to specific lakes and waterways rather than make generalizations about them. And so this is the seed production um, ripening and adaption strategies here. So, you know, the, the plant is really focused on after this pollination, um, it's really focused on energy, the, allocating its energy towards filling the seeds with nutrients for the next season. Um, and so if you're harvesting them when they're just the shells themselves, you can actually really damage um, a wild rice bed because you're totally destroying the next generation um, of rice that's supposed to come through. And these are some pictures here. Uh, here's, the, I, I believe that's the female part. Um, and then the seeds that are growing after the flowers have fallen off and died. Um, and then you can see from the husks themselves, you can see that tail up there. And on the right there is them, you know, with that, that husk pulled off. And so, you know, the, the part of my research that I really focus on is this um, incredible adaption that wild rice has to actually breathe oxygen into the sediment. So like, and there are other wetland plants that do this as well. Um, but wild rice actually takes in oxygen from its uh, biomass, not just in the water, but above the water, pumps it through its body and pushes the oxygen out into the sediment. And this oxygen is, it would otherwise be an oxygen deprived environment. So what does this oxygen do? Well, most reduced toxic species are oxidized. Um, and that oxidation of these reduced species can immobilize them in certain cases and protect the plant itself from the contaminant and also protect other uh, animals and plants that could potentially be impacted by um, this contaminant. And so there are different things that can impact wild rice's ability to breathe, basically. Um, you know, that, that sulfide mining that I had talked about early, there's actually a mechanism where um, sul iron sulfide can form right at the root surface and create such a thick enough layer that it is potentially inhibiting uh, nutrient uptake. And that can be, you know, obviously during the the stage of seed production when they're trying to fill the seeds with as much nitrogen and phosphorus as possible, that can be pretty dire for the plant. Uh, death, um, harvesting and reseeding. So like, like you saw in those pictures before, the seeds are actually torpedo shaped um, and they have these long thin tails on the bottom of them. And that's for when they're actually reached ripening stage, they're so heavy that they fall from the plant head, um, plant seed head, and they embed themselves into the sediment. Um, and this actually helps prevent, you know, the migration of seeds to another location um, if there isn't any outside disturbance. And like I said before, harvesting at the wrong time can cause permanent damage. So if you are gonna go harvesting, it's so critical to make sure that you check in with the people who are experts on this and in that specific area and have a greater understanding of the unique properties and characteristics of wild rice in that location. Um, and we also see, like I said before, this continuous addition of all of that biomass you see there in that top right picture to the bottom of the sediment bed. And up on the top left is, um, you know, as you walk, as you harvest wild rice itself, um, there's a lot, there's a couple different ways that you can do it. So when I went, I ended up going with the Lacta Flambeau wild rice technicians, I believe in 2018, um, to go ricing. And so you're on the canoe itself. Um, you're getting pushed around or, or you're doing the pushing. 
Um, and you take these sticks and you hit the rice in, but you, ha you have to make sure that you don't hit it too hard because you don't want to break the stand. The goal isn't to get all of the rice in the field. You actually want to leave some of the rice for other ricers. Um, the goal is to gently hit it in, allow some of those seeds to fall into the water and allow some of them to get into your boat. Not prepared for it when I went um, was the amount of spiders and worms that are there. Um, and guess what? They look exactly like the wild rice. So it's impossible to tell when you're you know, sitting in this huge canoe filled with wild rice, um, whether it's a wild rice seed crawling <laughs> or a worm or even a spider there. Um, and so, you know, on, on this bottom right, you can see this is a reseeding effort by, uh, I believe this is University of Wisconsin Green, Green Bay researchers. Um, and this is, you know, this, this is also one of the best times during senescence to, if you're going to reseed an area, just to try to recreate that seed drop, this is probably the best time for you to actually reseed and throw seeds in. And there's a, a couple different ways to do this. Um, there are ways that are backed by Western science. Um, and then there are some more traditional ecological knowledge, um, you know, methodology behind different ways to reseed. And I think, you know, based on a lot of what I've read and heard, um, that reseeding efforts often fail. And Glyphic recommends continuously returning to a site to keep reseeding over and over again. You want to keep adding seeds each season um, between like two to five years. There is a certain point where, you know, you have to ask yourself um, and the people that you're working with, you know, reseeding might not be the answer right now. You know, as we talked about before, um, there's actually an incredible need for the water quality and the sediment quality to be in a spot that the plant will actually germinate. So if you can actually fix some of the water quality issues, um, there may be reseeding efforts that failed in the past, but could potentially take hold in the future and breathe new life into um, a restoration project that was abandoned. So the paradox of Monoman's resilience, sensitivity, connectivity, and uniqueness. Um, critical. Um, it, it really stands out to me as, as a wetland plant, um, not only because of its ecological role, there is no plant like it within the uh, Great Lakes region, um, or really anywhere. It, it, it has still stayed around after so much pollution, um, climate change, degradation to their environment. And it is true that we've seen some pretty significant uh, losses. But I think that that uniqueness and that resiliency of wild rice also parallels itself in the communities that it's important to. Um, I think that, you know, it, a lot of people resonate with the story of wild rice. Um, they resonate with this powerful force that is prevailing against different climatic factors, different environmental degradation. And it, it really calls into question our roles as humans. Um, what can we do for rice? What can we do to support it and support that sensitivity and make up in areas where we've degraded these environments? Um, and so, you know, stepping forward into that, you know, what, what, what else can we do? Make sure you're always complying with those no wake zones, especially in late May, June, and July. If you are gonna go ricing, make sure that you get a permit from Wisconsin DNR um, and follow guidance from local rice chiefs and or uh, tribal and local natural resource managers for when the opening dates are, when the best time to do ricing is, and make sure that you still do, if there's a reporting system attached, um, make sure that you do fill out that reporting system and survey. Uh, definitely check out the work that's being done by the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, Glyphwick, and the different tribes, nations, and communities in the region that are fighting to protect and restore wild rice. So I mentioned a few of them, but if you, I know you're probably all over Wisconsin, but I, I would implore you to find, you know, nations and tribes that are closer to you um, and look into some of the wild rice restoration work that they're doing, because there's so much out there. Um, and also, you know, I, 
I really can't speak to the cultural importance enough. You know, if you want to um, learn more about that, there's a website called theways.org, where um, I believe this is Fred Ackley Jr., yes, from the Sokogan Chippewa of Mole Lake community. Um, you want, you know, you, you can't hear from a scientist or really a non, uh, a person that's not from this region, that's an indigenous person about the cultural importance of it. You should really hear it from the people that it impacts. Um, and yeah, so I apologize for this being a little bit shorter, but you know, a lot of the work that I do was funded by the Baldwin Wisconsin Idea Endowment. Um, and I do wanna give a special thanks to my lab manager um, and Susan Knight at Trout Lake Station as well as the many tribal partners um, and stakeholders who have helped to educate me over the years um, from Loch de Flambeau, Bad River, Red Cliff, um, as well as you know the endless amount of extension agents I've talked to and tried to work with on a lot of these different issues. Uh, and with that, I can take questions um, and I'd love to talk more about some of this together. Great, thank you, Dan. Please type any questions for her into the chat box. We'll wait a minute for questions to come in. Uh, would you like to talk more about the, the kind of the special um, specific way that wild rice is harvested as far as the type of poles and all that stuff is that's used? Yeah, absolutely. Let me go back to that. Oh gosh, there we go. Previous. You should be able to use the arrow key on the keyboard, I think, to quickly go back. Yeah, I, uh, for some reason, it doesn't work when sharing screen. OK. Oh, OK. So these are, if you can see this clearly, this little black bar is in my way. There we go. Um, so these are ricing poles, also known as knocking, knockers um, or knocking sticks. Uh, and so these are actually carved um, sticks that you use to hit the wild rice into the boat. Um, I, I have seen this. <laughs> I have seen them actually do. Uh, some of the carving and it's it's really awesome. I don't have a pair myself, um, but I do know that they have workshops sometimes where um, they bring people in and you can create some of these poles and knocking sticks together. And um, I think if if someone seeks a permit to harvest wild rice, they are required to have sticks that I, I think are a maximum length and made of wood and there's some other some other requirements if you do uh, get a permit to harvest wild rice as a non-indigenous person mm -hmm. yeah i don't know if they still have because I, I know when i did it they were on the verge of changing some things at the wisconsin dnr website um to get a wild rice permit but there are definitely it's listen, listen rules that you should follow when you're going out to harvest. Um, you shouldn't just go do it. Sure. Can you talk about some of the importance to wildlife? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so wild rice itself, not only is the biomass, the plant part of itself a food source, the rice can also be a food source for different um, animals. And so during its early life stages, when it's growing through the water column, um, and then when it hits floating leaf stage, that vegetative growth stage, it, it can actually serve as a nursery where fish can lay their eggs in the sediment and have the safe space um, to hatch and be a, you know, a nursery basically. Um, and for muskrats themselves, like I, I said in the presentation, it have a really cyclical relationship with them as well, um, where it's a habitat when it's in the aerial phase, but it's also a food source for them. And the muskrat is also a um, culturally important uh, animal to the Ojibwe people. Um, I know as far as, you know, it's it's not super well researched what, you know, the, these plant species that outcompete wild rice. Um, it, there's not a lot of research done on what their productivity and the services they provide versus, you know, the loss of the services that wild rice was giving. Um, but I can imagine that in some areas it, it's gonna have a pretty significant impact um, if it's being replaced by something that's perennial or a plant that doesn't 
maybe breathe as much oxygen into the sediment um, or maybe a plant that doesn't grow as dense. So it doesn't have as great of an ability to break fast moving water from these worsening uh, climatic events. Thank you. We have a couple other questions coming into the chat now. Pat was wondering who at Lac de Flambeau would be a good source of information about recreating habitat for growing wild rice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so there's probably, I think Joe Gravine, I think he might be really busy right now, but Joe Gravine's a great person. Um, Eric Chapman, uh, who else? I know that they actually have a whole natural resource department um, and there's actually several experts on their team um, concerning wild rice and they do have their own wild rice chiefs as well. Um, as far as recreating the environment itself, this is something that I've been doing at home right now in my greenhouse. Um, it, it is really challenging, but there is some documentation out there um, and precedent. I think the Gun Lake tribe in Michigan actually did a pretty successful um, recreation of a wild rice environment in a big pool um, in order to do a reseeding effort. Uh, so if you, th there is precedent for it and there is success for it. Okay, great. And there's a couple other messages that came to just me, so you guys aren't seeing them. Um, are there opportunities for guests to join our local First Nations as an immersion learning experience about the cultural meanings of wild rice to their communities? Yes, absolutely. So if you want to write this down, um, it's called the Indigenous uh, Arts and Science Program. If I can remember that right. The Indigenous Arts and Science Program at UW-Madison. Um, and they actually have, and, you know, in the age of COVID, it, it's really difficult. But beforehand, for K through 12 teachers, but also people in the general public that were interested or students could come. Um, and, and it's a more equitable way of doing it because this program actually pays the tribal partners that they work with. And in some of those workshops um, that are focused on, you know, how to rice properly, um, how to uh, carve the knockers, how to do, you know, the host of things that come after harvesting. So, you know, the processing part of it, getting the hulls off of it, um, what the storage of the seed looks like in order for consumption later. Okay. Another question about the four-year cycle that you mentioned, is that a, a consistent cycle? And if so, what drives it or determines good years versus poor years? Um, go ahead and take that one. And there's a couple more questions that were submitted by the same person, but I'll, I'll let you answer that first one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is, there, there's a lot of research done on this out of Dr. Pastor's lab from University of Minnesota Duluth um, that talks about how the impact of litter quality and quantity. So that litter, like I was saying before, that biomass, the plant mass, it's dying and continuously building on top of the sediment. Um, it's got to be broken down and it, it's being and the microbes are also responsible for breaking down the nitrogen into a plant available form. But the microbes themselves also, they are, when we have a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, just meaning that there's a lot of carbon available for consumption compared to the nitrogen available, the carbon stimulates the microbes so much that they're going to take all of the nitrogen for themselves because um, they need nitrogen. They're, they're also dependent on this nutrient versus when they have, when there's lower carbon, there's less litter. Um, there's less of that biomass um, that isn't broken down yet. Maybe there was a bad year or uh, it was just recently reseeded or something like that. If there isn't a lot of litter above, then um, the microbes will end up mineralizing the nitrogen and that creates um, this plant available form of nitrogen that this, uh, that the wild race actually needs. And, you know, the, this is, it is pretty well studied in isolated environments, but I don't think it's very well studied in natural environments. And so the, the part that actually comes into this four year cycle. Um, so when we see this really great year and then the next year it's really bad, it's because during the really great year, uh, 
there's just so much biomass. The plants are doing really well. The when the plants die, they're so um, filled with carbon and nitrogen, but lots of carbon, lots of food for the microbes to get stimulated by. And so they eat through it, they take up all the nitrogen, the seeds um, stay dormant for the next year usually. Uh, and even though it, it can look pretty alarming to have no rice the next year, the cycle is actually pretty healthy for the environment. Um, so the next year, the litter will be broken down enough that there's enough nitrogen available for the seeds to germinate and have two good years before they have another boom bust cycle. Very interesting. Um, the other two questions from that person were wondering about reseeding and reintroduction efforts and how successful those efforts have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't know about every reseeding effort out there. I just know the vast majority of the ones I've heard about in the past and current um, have either failed or they don't look very good. Um, reseeding is incredibly difficult. And I, I think it comes down to a lot. Um, people wanna reseed without doing any of the water or sediment quality testing. Um, and the, the problem is, the problem isn't that there just isn't rice in a lot of these locations. The problem is the water quality and the climate. So there are just places where we're just continuously adding wild rice um, for these receding projects, but then it, nothing's happening. They're just either in dormancy or they they die early in germination. Um, so, you know, and I, I'm not saying that there aren't any successful receding efforts. It's just for the most part, they're either unsuccessful or they're very temporarily successful. And then they kind of revert back. Um, it's really difficult to change, uh, you know, if, if there's a significant climate event that impacts an area. I mean, you can't, you, you have to work against climate change itself and try to build a more resilient environment rather than just continuously adding more seeds. So it's more about making sure that the conditions are appropriate for growing rice instead of just dumping seed in year after year. Yes, and that's, that can be condescending to say, you know, as a sediment biogeochemist, there are natural ways of um, reseeding that, you know, my work doesn't, it's not trying to negate um, it's just to say that, you know, if, if, you know, if the place where you're at isn't healthy, you know, you, you're not going to be healthy. So we have to redirect our efforts to doing something that's more productive for everyone at the end. Mm -hmm. Well, that is all the questions in the chat. We can wait just a bit here to see if anyone has some, any last minute questions to put into the chat. All right, seeing none. Thanks again, Dance, for presenting today. And thanks everyone for joining us for today's webinar. Remember, if you have any suggestions for a future presentation, please let me know and I'll see what I can arrange for the next webinar series. And with that, I hope everyone has enjoyed the six webinars of this series and have a great evening and a wonderful season at the lake. Well, thanks a lot, Dance. We had uh, 17, I believe, was as high as we got. Um, we had about 35 registered. So I think a lot of people know that uh, if they don't actually join the webinar, they'll still receive emails about it with the recording. So people were obviously interested in watching the recording later and maybe sharing that with others.